Welcome to Norse Code, episode 119, your Super Bowl 50 preview special, regrettably not featuring the Minnesota Vikings. However, we are featuring the entire Norse Code staff in panel form for your listening enjoyment. To my right on the internet is our uh, regular in-house analyst, blogger extraordinaire, and useful human, Arif Hassan. How you doing, Arif? I'm good, I'm good. How are you, Dusty? Uh, I am well. I, uh, I'm looking forward to this weekend, I think, uh, having read a bit. like So we talked on the show a couple weeks ago about how the Arizona game, the Arizona-Carolina game, potentially was going to be the most exciting game of the season, and then it was not that. And Not I've, even remotely. Unfortunately, uh, like The other game that weekend was. Yes, but I've read enough about this game now to where I think that it could be... Uh, the new most exciting game of the year. So at least that is my hope. Uh, joining me to the even further right <laughs> across the internet I is I feel like that our, implies uh, something else. <laughs> occasional host and producer, uh, intrepid human James Bogachnik. How are you, James? I am fantastic. You know, my biggest worry about the game actually has nothing to do with the football being played. I just hope somebody is watching uh, Alcatraz Island the entire time because if a, ho- if a homegrown terrorist ends up taking it over and has like a nerve agent, then we have to get Sean Connery and Nick Cage over their stat. Did you know that uh, when they were filming The Rock, Sean Connery had them build a cabin for him on Alcatraz? I Because did he didn't want that. to commute to the island every day? <laughs> what? <laughs> Not even joking. That's, that's, that's a way better reason than like, I'm a method actor and I need to immerse myself. And I probably shouldn't make fun of that because some of those actors are really good. But it's just like, no, I just don't want to deal with it. Like, no, it's, I'm it's not way I'm reason. not riding the boat to and from Alcatraz every day. Screw that. Oh, You're building me a cabin. Actually, I'd rather live in a prison than... Well, not in a prison, on the island, on the same island as a prison. A little yeah, bit of a exactly. difference. exactly, in a cabin on prison grounds. That's that's like the difference between living in a van down by the river and just living, you know, in the river. That's not if remotely close what? to that. Living in... <laughs> All right, just that... because there's a location near a location doesn't mean the two situations are analogous. It's a rock in the ocean. That was a the... big part of Alcatraz's security. I'm just going to put that out there. Actually, I think the biggest uh, selling point on the whole like building it in Santa Clara as opposed to San Francisco thing was that it would be more difficult for people to launch rockets from Alcatraz with nerve agents to, uh, to, distri- to disrupt a football game. How prescient. How nice of them to think of that. All right. On that note, Norse Code remains the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings because of the support of listeners like you. Our Patreon program has turned into a, I would say, moderate to great success. And uh, we're greatly appreciative of the core listenership that is kind enough to pony up a couple of bucks every month and keep the lights on, so to speak. Uh, Learn more at NorseCodePodcast.com or you can go to Patreon.com slash NorseCode become a uh, recurring member of any dollar amount you wish. So there's not a whole lot of Vikings news this week to cover. Uh, We at Norse Code are committed to bringing you the finest in wildly speculative rumor. Uh, The latest coming from the Daily Norseman, uh, Christopher Gates writes about (laughs) his sneaking suspicion that uh, 2015 Heisman Trophy winner Alabama running back Derrick Henry may be on his way to the Vikings. And I'm not sure if this is just like a kind of uh, a manifestation of everybody's kind of not so secret desire to trade Adrian Peterson, but uh, it it kind of reads that way. I mean, this is, it would be great if we could pick up uh, Derek Henry, but uh, but is that is that something we would do? Well, in fairness, let's clarify a little bit. Uh, Eric Galco of Optimum Scouting, who's actually done he does this uh, every couple of weeks before the draft, between you know playoffs and the draft, where uh, he finds like rumors around the NFL and posts them. He's going to come up with one after the combine too. So this actually comes from Eric Galco. He has a pretty good track record, uh, but with the Vikings, uh, he has been 
maybe a little less accurate, but he hasn't had that much stuff to say about the Vikings, so that would be unfair. But with regards to Derrick Henry in general, yeah, I, I can believe it. Uh, from my understanding, it sounds like that they have a first-round grade on Derrick Henry, which means that they're higher on Henry than um, a lot of third-party services and probably a couple of teams, which means that if he falls far enough, they'd be willing to select him. Um, I think I think the question really just is, how far does he have to fall before it counts as far enough? And my guess is near the end of the second round, you probably trade uh, your third round pick and some other stuff to get up into the second round or trade down in the second round to grab him and someone else. Um, that's that's my guess. And then if that happens, then you have to figure out sort of, you're probably only going to have Adrian for one year if you don't trade him anyway because he's the cap hit for him is going to be eight. Million dollars in, in 2017. That's just obscene. Um, and so you probably don't have Adrian in 2017 either way. So if you can grab a running back of of Derrick Henry's quality, it makes sense. And if you trade Adrian Peterson, that's well, that's it. That's I mean, that's the perfect situation because then you can have Jarek McKinnon and Derrick Henry and you know, like a thunder and lightning scenario. I think Jarek McKinnon's a, a good starting running back kind of player, but you know, who knows? You could add Derrick Henry, maybe you would. There's that. That takes care of the uh, Vikings portion of the podcast, at least until we get to the mailbag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the well, I mean, there's a couple of you know early mock drafts coming out, but we've got plenty of time, literally after this Sunday, to dissect every single one. You know, we could actually probably devote an episode to each of the major mock drafts being done by like major mock drafters and Vikings bloggers. But there is, I understand, a football match on Sunday that is of some import, determining the uh, national champions of the, uh, of, I, I guess, the American Football League? No, not, well, sort of. At any rate. <laughs> it is the premier football league in America. I was actually told on a radio appearance I made earlier today uh, to try and not say the word Super Bowl, uh, which is kind of dumb is that like the south saying they don't want to hear the word civil war they prefer war between the states <laughs> like, I, I, what's, I think, is, is is it really like that much of a branding issue not the war between the states it's the war of northern aggression um i yeah i don't know the radio station i was on was not an official affiliate of the vikings which was the reason i was given the person who told me this was is, basically said i have no idea why we're doing this this is the reason i was given to tell you uh, we have said the word Super Bowl many times on this show, I can assure you, but this week I guess it's a problem. Um, I don't think that whatever who, whatever enforcement body would want to enforce them, I don't think that they would be able to have that hold up because when your event is a popular event, you have the right to talk about it. Is So basically somebody rebroadcast of the, without written consent of the National Football League. Somebody sitting there with a... Uh, uh, right. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's the exact same thing. If, if I'm reading it correctly, then according to like lawyers in the league or lawyers for this organization, then the words Super Bowl themselves constitute unauthorized rebroadcast of football. So should our goal to be saying the word Super Bowl as many times as possible? I don't really even think we'll have to try. I've always said that my biggest like goal in life is to like is to go to jail and have on my record be that i rebroadcast of the consent of the national football league so i mean <laughs> what are you doing in here, you in what, are you what are you doing in here white collar crime what are you doing in here? Oh, i said the word super bowl on a podcast i said it i said the word super bowl 38 times in the middle of a bunch of references to a 90s movie starring sean connery and all of a sudden all of a sudden i ended up here it was crazy Roger Del- Goodell came in here and like waterboarded me too. It was nuts. If it was a vidcast uh, in the corner of the screen, we would definitely have a counter that would ting every time we said Super Bowl. You know, kind of like the South Park episode yep. where the yeah. counter went up every time they said shit, and then yeah. like the cursed demon came. <laughs> Not to spoil that episode. The cursed demon may still come um, by the end of the episode. We don't know. Um, geez, Super Bowl, huh? Or it's finally going to happen? I mean, the the Cursed Demon is sort of here. I mean, I've got an article by Greg Easterbrook in the show notes. Oh, good lord. Dusty, you're fired. You, n- no. <laughs> what? Where did you learn to do this? Where? Tell me, where, tell me who taught you how to do this. 
Well, I only bring it up because... He uh, learned it from watching you, James. He learned it from watching you. That is such crap. I have never linked a Nia Craig Easterbrook. <laughs> Not once. Not even that one time in college when all the other kids were doing it. No. All right. Well, I only do it because uh, Easterbrook, the, uh, the the scion of NFL writing that he is, uh, in his Tuesday morning quarterback this week, writes about how uh, Pro Football's most valuable players announced the night before the Super Bowl and the season's award is expected to go to Cam Newton. Let's hope he does a dab. Does Wait, a dab? I, I don't like... I mean, I know it's a dance, but I feel like Greg Easterbrook just like has heard this word and wanted to include it in his column to seem as though he was <laughs> of the times. But what, For sure. What strikes me, and it's always weird whenever I hear just like like squares, like like Ellen DeGeneres or Hillary Clinton or Greg Easterbrook talking about uh, about doing the dab or doing a dab, because uh, that means something much different in Denver and I suspect you know California and uh, in Washington where cannabis is legal than it does uh, on Good Morning America. Oh, what does it mean, Dusty? It is the in act- states where cannabis happens to be legal. <laughs> uh, it is the act of smoking uh, the most powerful available like marijuana concentrate, like uh, like pot flowers, like really, really like you know the the ones that your uh, anti drug class warns you about are like fifteen to twenty percent you know THC, and uh, some of the waxes they use. Oh, to the death. ones they feature in Reefer Madness. Yes, exactly. They cause you to go violent. Exactly, go violent and paranoid chew your fingernails off in a closet. Um, so these, uh, these extracts, some of these wax extracts are like 70 to 75% THC. So they are quite strong. So Easterbrook wants... So we're definitely hoping that Cam Newton does the dab. If, if Cam Newton does a dab before the Super Bowl, he will probably be too high to play. <laughs> He's got a pretty big body, man. He, uh, he, 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 are does. Strong. Yeah, he does have a pretty big body, but I mean, Cam Newton's play means a lot more than Peyton Manning's play in the game. So, I mean, this, this could be it, that that could be the decision maker. And if Dusty, whose only f- real fan allegiance is to the town he lives in, um, I, I think Dusty's hoping that uh, Cam Newton does a dab. Only, if only an enterprising member of the Denver Broncos organization have found some access to marijuana somehow. <laughs> was able to slip into Cam. If only All there I'm was a way. That Von Miller and Cam Newton are already in the same city. <laughs> Damn. And it takes two seconds to get a script. Well, and let's let's hope that Cam Newton gets so high that he inhales the dab and then forgets that it's not like a regular weed pipe and grabs the uh, what is known as the dab nail, which is like a piece of red hot glass. Burns the fingers on his throwing hand. That'll that'll even up the score a little bit, I would think. The listeners are learning something today. So that's that's my educational piece. So thanks, Greg Easterbrook, for uh, giving me the opportunity to segue into a brief conversation about cannabis extract. Ray, there may be a game to talk about too. That's true. If, if we if we wanted to do something that bold, <laughs> if we dare. Uh, there's a great Sports Illustrated article that uh, promises all 22 footage, but you know, per NFL policy, I'm sure uh, it's heavily zoomed in, and there's no video, just uh, you know, highlights on still pictures. But what? yeah, I know, I know. They just they just draw little boxes around the key players and don't show like any of the motion. But it's it's fairly well narrated, and it does a pretty good job of breaking down kind of the the key matchups and the things that the game will turn on. Uh, Primarily that uh, Cam Newton, if he gets bottled up by Denver's excellent defensive line, could could experience some issues. And uh, if Peyton Manning can't connect with Owen Daniels, then the game may well be over. Owen Daniels specifically? Uh, Well, and the the, the evidence for this is uh, Carolina despite having a relatively strong defense, has been historically weak, this season at least, against tight ends. Especially tight ends who sit down, you know, in between uh, the middle and deep layers of the defense. And that is functionally the outside of Peyton Manning's, like, accurate throw distance. (laughs) Uh, I feel like I've actually heard that a lot this year, at least 
in our previews for a lot of the games that we did. So we heard it uh, both times with the Seahawks when we had a Seahawks guest on. We heard it uh, when we brought an Atlanta Falcons guest on, uh, which, you know, I guess that turned out to be pretty true. Um, and I think we heard it when I think Justice said basically the same thing, too, about Green Bay. So the, the big matchup that, uh, that Denver is going to need to win is uh, Derek Wolf and Malik Jackson against uh, Trey Turner and Andrew Norwell. And we saw a lot of Derek Wolf and Malik Jackson. Well, actually, if we're being totally fair, Tom Brady saw a lot of Derek Wolf <laughs> Jackson in the AFC Championship game. You saw quite enough of Malik Jackson and Derek Wolf. <laughs> More than enough. Uh, but, but that's basically going to have to be the same game plan against Cam Newton, right? Like you have to be able to uh, get past Colorado's, or not Colorado, Carolina's uh, outstanding offensive line and get Cam Newton to not just like run the football freely, which you know he's the first player ever to have, what is it, like 400 rushing yards in a season alongside 3,000 passing yards. But, like, the only thing he doesn't do well is throw under pressure. And, I mean, do you, do you think that Denver is going to be able to execute on, uh, on a plan that was able to take down one of the best postseason passers of all time? Uh, yeah, well, I think um, so this is a, a pretty interesting question because this is the first time Denver is going to see a good offensive line in quite some time. Um, I didn't look completely back, but they've had a good run near the end of the season and in the playoffs of playing against uh, some some pretty bad offensive lines. And this offensive line is more known for its run blocking than it is for its pass protection, but Cam does still have time in the pocket. So uh, obviously that's going to be a big part of the game. Um, I, I just don't know because it's it's obvious it's not the same thing as uh, as as Brady. I mean, you're right that one of the few things that that Cam's not good at, the very few uh, QBs, even you know all time greats, are good at is playing under pressure. Um, but you know Cam does have the added element of being able to run and being at 250 pounds, running through linebackers that weigh 15 pounds less than him. So uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be tough just because you're going to have to take different angles than you're used to taking against a pretty good offensive line. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a key to the game. Um, if they can do it, I think that they'll be able to get pressure. They're the number one defense in the NFL for a reason. Um, but I don't know if they'll be able to do it at the rate that they'll want to or that they're used to doing it. Who do you think has a better rushing performance, Cam Newton or C.J. Anderson? <laughs> like in terms of total yards? Uh, yeah, I, I think you could throw touchdowns in there. Uh, man, CJ uh, Anderson has had like a, a pretty good, pretty good run the past couple of weeks. So I'm gonna pick Cam Newton though. There's actually yeah, that's tough. There's, there's, there's actually a really prop out there for who ends up with more uh, more yards, Cam Newton or CJ Anderson. There's a cop out. There's a there's a prop uh, prop bet out. Oh wow. What's the uh, what's the plus minus like? Who gets who gets gifted what number of yards? Uh, we'll probably end up talking about it later in the show, but uh, I remember seeing that uh, online this week and going, "Oh, well, that's that's interesting." Huh. We got well, an put email. me down for Cam. Yeah, I, I I'll put five dollars on Cam. Five Drew Majesties on Cam Newton. Uh, All right. There's a we we got an email from the Boveda uh, like publicity department. Offering well, I get emails from them every week. I forwarded it to the show because it'd be interesting. This oh, you happen to catch this one? Well, this is great because uh, yeah, there's I don't I don't remember seeing that one, but there's uh, some great props in here that yes, as James teased, we will discuss a bit later. So who do you think has a, okay? So follow up to my uh, to my last question: Who do you think has a uh, a better rushing game, Jonathan Stewart or C.J. Anderson? Jonathan Stewart. Really? Yeah. I mean, I guess Denver is better known for their pass rush than their than their run blocking. Yeah, I don't know. It's tough because uh, there's actually a really good piece uh, by Danny Kelly, guest of the show, uh, two times this year, um, and he puts a, he put out a really good piece about how the Denver offense looks different 
uh, in the past couple of games uh, with Peyton Manning than it did early in the season with Peyton Manning. And it's not because it's you know good, but the schematically the offense is different and the way that they've handled things is different. Uh, and how they've been ba- able to integrate, you know, Peyton Manning and shotgun. How they're in shotgun far less often than they're used to uh, with Peyton Manning. I mean, they were like in shotgun like eighty percent of the time at the beginning of the year. Now they're only in shotgun about fifty percent of the time. Uh, and how the running game has finally cohered under the Kubiak Peyton marriage, where before it hadn't. And so, and we'll link that piece in the show notes. It's really good. It talks about you know not just the different kind of running plays, but like how things have changed. Uh, you know, since since Peyton was injured. Uh, and so the running game is markedly different than it was at the beginning of the year. So you can't just rely on your inherent distrust of C.J. Anderson, which is fair to have. Um, but I think despite that, I'm still going to pick Jonathan Stewart. As any reasonable person would. Uh, even the writer for the Mile High Report uh, Sada Rain, who uh, writes the Super Bowl No Bull preview <laughs> for, uh, for Mile High Report, is cautiously optimistic about Denver's chances, but admits that a lot of things will need to go right. And one of those things is a successful tandem performance from Anderson and Ronnie Hillman. And I mean, and as he writes in the article, you know, it can happen, but, uh, but it doesn't always. <laughs> That's a. That's a generous way to put it, but I suppose uh, in a preview that's centered around optimism, maybe maybe you have to be a little bit generous. Well, so how much of that is on the, I guess, kind of average play calling? I mean, I think Denver and Minnesota fans can share a lot of complaint in how just sort of boring and uh, maybe maybe ineffective the run first offense has been this season. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think that well, I think the the decision to call you know runs and passes and stuff like that improves with Peyton Manning on the field, not because you know he's an excellent passer or anything like that, um, but because if you're in a bad look, you you have the ability to check out of them. Whereas I think with Norv Turner and Teddy Bridgewater, I mean, it's not that Teddy doesn't get uh, you know a, a reasonable amount of free reign in the offense or that. You know, sometimes the checks are to other runs instead of, you know, other passes or anything like that. It's just Payne Manning has complete freedom to call multiple plays at the line of scrimmage. Whereas, you know, Teddy has a kill call um, or sometimes has the ability to audible entirely. Uh, and so if there's a bad look, um, 100% of the time, Payne Manning has the ability to exploit that with the right play. Whereas, uh, you know, maybe not 100% of the time, Teddy has that ability either because the plays that he has the ability to call aren't the right play against the look or because maybe in that specific situation or circumstance, he doesn't have the right to call a new play. So I think that it is a little bit different with a, with a, with a player like Peyton Manning and the, and the amount of latitude that he gets out there than it is with Teddy Bridgewater. But I think that it makes sense that in excess or uh, of predictability when calling runs uh, can lead to some of those problems in fairness um, you, I, I kind of do want to point out that like the individual plays that are called, I mean, it's just zone running. There's only like three or four plays running plays in the playbook. So, um, you know, the individual play calls are not the issue. It's just, you know, how often they call it. And to some extent that I think that's mitigated by having uh, Peyton. In a couple of sentences that will seem very familiar to many Vikings fans, uh, the author writes, I think that uh, some play action early would be good to set them back on their heels, but I expect we'll see a lot of runs on first down instead, giving us limited production. Yeah, okay. That does sound familiar, but not unfair. I mean, look what they did against the Patriots. They didn't even have to throw the ball all that often in order to win the game. They just ended up running it down their throat. Yeah, and they did it in in some interesting ways too. The the piece that I'm referencing again, it'll be in the show notes. Even pointed out a play where there were seven offensive linemen on the field, and two tight ends. So the Carolina defense forced seven, uh, or or yeah, forced seven turnovers in uh, the game against Arizona. Denver leads the league in interceptions with twenty four. 
where would you, how badly do you think the Panthers are going to embarrass Denver <laughs> in the turnover battle? Not that, not that I'm giving you a clue as to, to what I think is going to happen in this game, but, uh, but seriously, how bad is it going to be? I think, um, I think maybe it's not going to be as bad as, as it, it may initially sound. So Peyton Manning led the league in interceptions for most of the year, despite not having played in like seven or eight games uh, by the time the, that he lost the interception lead to someone who was actually playing. Um, he's still, he's, you finished the year ranked second, I think. Um, but I think, you know, the question is, is this the same Peyton Manning? And it seems like it's not. The first playoff game, he actually played pretty well. I thought that he was, uh, you know, done poorly by his receivers, something like, depending on who you ask, five to eight drops in that game. Um, and then in the, in the second game against the Patriots and, you know, James, you said that, you know, they didn't pass the ball all that much when they passed the ball. It wasn't like he was stellar or anything, but he didn't look, you know, terrible. And so from that two game sample, you know, I think that it's probably not the same Peyton Manning we saw for most of the beginning of the season, who evidently had a plantar fasciitis or whatever it is. It's plantar fascia was swollen. Is that what the injury is? Anyway, yeah, it was bad. Um, so I think it'll be different, but I still think it'll be a problem. I, I I expect Carolina to get at least two turnovers, and that's really telling. Is Thomas Davis really going to end up playing out there with a broken wrist at linebacker? It's the Super Bowl, man. Well, probably there. There's a difference between having like a club on your hand because you broke your thumb and a giant Mega Man style club because you broke your wrist. Yeah, but it's the Super Bowl. Yeah, but are you actually going to be effective other uh, other than swatting balls down and like taking cricket shots at them? Like what's like, I, I'm just well, I'm just imagining Owen Daniels breezing by him so so easily. Hmm. He is practicing fully this week. So, well, like you said, it's the Super Bowl. So he's he's taking the the Terrell Owens drugs that he took before the Super Bowl, hyperbaric chamber <laughs> and uh, rest, and some. Uh, he's he's doing the Hulk Hogan thing too, vitamins and prayers and all that. Yeah, I'm sure he's also taking a, a page out of Ray Lewis's playbook. Uh, get some so, some, some uh, deer antler spray, some deer antler. Maybe uh, talk to Peyton's wife. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> see, see what she does for if, if she if she emerges management. if she emerges from the sea and throws a package of HGH. <laughs> uh, oh, he he hey, guaranteed that he'll play. So that's basically it. The Panthers have claimed twenty four interceptions from opponents. Well, there's an article on ESPN.com uh, that says that this game is going to turn on Peyton Manning and. Uh, that is that sounds you know ludicrous on face, because uh, you know what uh, what has he done this season besides throw picks? <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's basically the two top defenses in the league, you know, battling each other, and uh, it's just going to come down to who has the uh, the more consistent quarterbacking performance. And uh, I wish I could find the author's name. I'm having a lot all kinds of issues here. Can't find the author's name. Is it the one linked in the show notes? Uh, yeah, Jeff Legwold actually predicts oh, okay. a 24-21 Broncos victory. That's really close for, uh, for... It sounds like you're saying that the preview is basically saying, well, one and two in defense, so it depends on the quarterbacks. So and there's a pretty... I mean, don't... Like, I think I'm right about this, but there's been a pretty significant difference in their play over the course of the year, this year. So that's a really close... Uh, that's a really close prediction for like saying, "Hey, uh, it's it's going to come down to the quarterbacks because the defenses may, you know, sort of wash each other out." Well, the uh, the Broncos batter opposing quarterbacks. They have battered even the best quarterbacks the league has to offer. Made them tentative in the pocket. Yeah, which but as you, I said, maybe if, the only way to win. If you look at the Panthers' play over the past several weeks, their main thing has been the first two quarters. It doesn't matter how good your defense is. They're just going to storm you and end up taking the lead. So if you end up putting yourself in that sort of position where you end up going up 
14 or 21 points, you end up forcing Peyton Manning to start doing Peyton Manning things, and that's not necessarily a positive in this point of his career. So is it even possible that the game ends up staying that close? I'm really curious about that. So I um, so I ended up picking uh, Denver against the spread. And the spread's like five and a half points, right? Um, just because I think it's a different Peyton Manning than the one we saw at the beginning of the season, and maybe maybe I'm totally wrong about that. And I, I fully admit I didn't put too much into the game because I thought, hey, a lot of this I'm just betting with my heart. I really want Peyton Manning to get a ring. Uh, everyone knows that I've long uh, held that Peyton Manning is, uh, is the best quarterback in NFL history and, uh, you know, is somebody that is maybe my favorite non-Vikings player of all time. Who knows? And you can't wait to but, cheer uh, for him on the uh, on the Rams next year? <laughs> I heard about that. Probably not. That's probably not happening. That was yeah, amazing. The, the most amazing thing about that story breaking today about the Rams having some sort of interest in, uh, in Peyton Manning was how quickly an injury report came out about how Peyton Manning may need hip surgery. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> like, no! Bad Rams. Bad. <laughs> well, can you imagine how much it would cement Peyton Manning's legacy, though, if he took, especially out of the NFC West with the Seattle, the Seattle Seahawks are, if he took the Rams to the Super Bowl? He <laughs> didn't even have to win it. He just has to take Jeff Fisher out of 8-8. Eight and eight. <laughs> Taking Jeff Fisher out of 8-8 eight and eight might, like, need to be put on his Hall of Fame bust. <laughs> if, he, if he accomplished that. Or, actually, the better thing would be he, they went eight and eight, but they ended up going to the playoffs and then to the Super Bowl. That that would at least be in keeping. Oh, that would with be the, astounding with like, the spirit of Jeff Fisher and his mustache. Right, they couldn't get away from what it means to have Jeff Fisher as a coach, but they could manipulate the impact that that has. That's that's why they call him the sheriff. He comes into town and just takes it over. <laughs> Uh, there's also an interesting story uh, that uh, I didn't put in the show notes, but I will put it in uh, the show notes uh, when we publish uh, about Peyton Manning's legacy or, or talk about sort of his legacy kind of reminded me, you know, like, hey, what is Peyton Manning's legacy? Does does winning the Super Bowl have an impact, you know, on his legacy? And I say to me it really doesn't. But to I think most people at large, I think that it does. Uh, and this article details a lot about Peyton Manning's play in the playoffs because everyone agrees Peyton Manning is the best regular season quarterback in NFL history. And, of course, that's a backhanded compliment, right? That's like yeah, because it comes he's with its worst in the postseason. Well, that's, that's, the, that's our understanding of it, right? Or he may not be the worst, but teams he has played for have been remarkably unsuccessful in the postseason. More right, and – think. Right, and that would make you raise an eyebrow if you're doing sort of quarterback evaluation, right? Like, well, it just so happens, you know, that he's got like 13 one and duns or whatever, right? Uh, surely that's not all on the supporting cast. Uh, and the article actually does a really good job talking about how um, Peyton Manning has had truly an insane run of, of, of playoffs. And, you know, you don't want to talk about luck. Right, because fifteen, really, fifteen Super Bowl appearances, and we want to talk about, or fifteen playoff appearances, and we want to talk about luck. Um, yeah, wouldn't that even out? But uh, there's a there's a, some really good stuff in here that once you take into account, you know, like the weather and the level of play that he's had and stuff like that, um, that actually, you know, he comes out, you know, really ahead. Like his passing DVOA after you adjust for the weather and strength of his opponent is eighth all time. That's better than Tom Brady, who's 11th. That's better than Aaron Rodgers, who's 10th. That's better than John Elway, known clutch artist, at 9th, right? Uh, his ESPN QBR is 6th all time. That also takes into account, in this case, it takes into account uh, some of the weird stuff that's happened. I mean, uh, QBR, uh, for all of, the, all of the lumps that it's taken, at least accounts for things like uh, you know, whether or not a player causes an interception versus a quarterback, it takes into account the number of drops that a player has had. Uh, and, uh, you know, in a lot of these games, uh, Peyton Manning has led the team to a win, and then his defense lost the game. I mean, we remember uh, the Raheem Moore 
uh, touchdown that he gave up uh, against the Baltimore Ravens in 2012, the year the Baltimore Ravens uh, won the Super Bowl, right? That's not on Peyton Manning at all. Um, he actually has had uh, six uh, games where he's held the fourth quarter lead, and his defense was the one who uh, who lost the game for him. So, I mean, it's not like, you know, Warren Moon, like, you know, they scored like 40 points or 35 points and they couldn't uh, – they couldn't score more points to stop the comeback from happening. It's not like that. It's like the it's like in the fourth quarter, the defense is the one they gave it up. And so when you take a look at like the individual games, like yeah, the 2006 run where he won a Super Bowl had a surprising number of interceptions, but also there's a surprising number of those interceptions that were not his fault. Or uh, he played in like the worst weather in Super Bowl history, uh, going back to like the Ice Bowl or something like that. Um, but then you know at some point you're just like, there's no way he has this many excuses. So. Uh, it is kind of weird. It's a really good article. Uh, I think he's the best quarterback of all time, but I do think that he needs to, you know, quote unquote, win this in order to cement uh, the legacy that he might want to have. Well, wait, if it's not necessarily his fault that his playoff record is what it is, uh, wouldn't you be able to say that this game might not impact his legacy as much because chances are it will be won on the backs of the defense? I would say it shouldn't. But in the same way that those games that are not, you know, necessarily entirely his fault, in the same way that those games have impacted his legacy, uh, this game, which if they win, uh, like 90% certainty won't be because of him, uh, you know, will impact his legacy. I mean, because if you're talking to a person that just believes in quarterback wins, then how could they take this away from him when they took away like the 2004 run away from him? Because Tom Brady fans are insufferable. That's why. Do you know his kickers have missed clutch field goals twice in the playoffs? That's two of his 13 losses. That's a, that's a terrible way to lose a playoff. Yes, Question. well, that's what happens when you've got your idiot kicker. Yeah. Question. <laughs> has, the, has the guy who is, who is ranked second in interceptions for the year, for the league, has that man ever won a Super Bowl? He's won one. He won in 2006. No, I'm not saying Peyton Manning as a person. I'm saying in league history as the person who is ranked oh. second in interceptions for yeah, the Would Peyton year. Manning be the first? Yeah, would he be the first person oh. to do that? Uh, I don't know. I guess we'd have to figure out if like any of Brett Favre's or Joe Namath's wins happen in seasons where they threw a bunch of interceptions. Because those are the ones that come to mind. Trent Dilfer actually threw a lot despite his reputation for game management. Um, I'm really curious. But despite, I'll probably look this up. Despite his uh, his reputation for dimes, yeah, well, his reputation for being a game manager, and that in theory precludes throwing a lot of interceptions. I'd be interested to find out if that's actually a if if that's actually a thing, because at some point you are who you are in the uh, in the playoffs, and this this new Peyton Manning aside, I just I don't see a scenario where they're going to be able to just rely on the run. It feels it this this whole game just has a feeling of Peyton Manning is going to have to do more this game than he's had to the last two. If this Super Bowl starts out like the last time Denver went to the Super Bowl and oh, they get God. the ball first and they know that if they need a little bit of momentum and the first score on the board in order to, you know, take down Carolina, but then they bungle it and Carolina scores a safety, is the game, can we just all go home? Is the game immediately over at that point? Head yeah, to, and now you have to cancel your Super Bowl parties and, uh, or to, like take out the Xbox. Head to the Xbox. score it yourself. Yeah. Switch it to the Puppy Bowl. Exactly. Yeah. Did we ever find out if the Puppy Bowl has, if there's a daily fantasy thing for the Puppy Bowl? I didn't look because screw you, James. The I, entry fee is one bullet I, applied directly to your head. I was just curious if something like that existed, if there were hardcore... Uh, gamblers out there that were actually interested in doing a daily fantasy game for the Puppy Bowl. You can, I, I didn't see the uh, actual uh, betting on it, but th odds exist for the game. <laughs> that is the most rigged what? nonsense I have ever heard. I guarantee you there's you odds exist for information the on the Puppy Bowl. Was it, uh, was it last year they had put out actual odds on the, uh, on the Puppy Bowl? My God. Well, I'm you sure used that to there's be able like to, you used to be able to entry limit. Yeah, you used to be able to bet on uh, um, on which would win in the Bud Bowl, 
So I'm not terribly surprised. <laughs> yeah, that's the sort of thing that like definitely like each casino imposes like a maximum bet. Yeah. Degenerate gamblers only through this door, please. <laughs> How nervous is Vegas about this game? Everybody's betting on Carolina. The line started out at like three and a half or four, depending on where you I look. Was, now I it's like surprised. five and a half or six. And some like you see rumblings that might even get to seven, which, wow. Yeah, I think Vegas might lose. I was surprised to see that three and a half line. Like to a non sharp like me, that seemed like a foolish move. And then the sharps took advantage and then the line moved. So, yeah, that was that was nuts. Could be Vegas a, might lose big. Yeah. yeah. Vegas could be uh sad for a, for a rare day and that's, you know, why the why the line has has moved so aggressively is they're just trying to get more money to hedge their eventual losses when Carolina waxes Denver like that car that was waxed to a mirror finish on Reddit. <laughs> Peyton Manning's helmet mark is going to be so red that it's actually like a mirror. I think you'll be able to see Cam Newton like smiling in the helmet dent. <laughs> was it ever determined if uh, if Jared Allen was actually going to play this game or if uh, Rivera is going to just force him to be on the uh, on the sidelines? I just oh. a tweet to the effect that Jared Allen is pretty much fine and the team was just resting him. However, I imagine that is team source that said that. So just fine. He broke his foot. Uh, he's just he's just fine. We're well, just letting him rest. His well, broken foot, broken uh, feet, broken wrists. These things don't mean anything in the 21st century, Arif. These things can <laughs> just be fixed by uh, by sprinkling a little bit of deer antler spray and a little bit of uh, Manning's wife's HGH, and you're fine. <laughs> well, uh, I did I did just look it up on Roto World. It sounds like uh, they expect him to be ready to play uh, and to be at 100. percent So. There's that. Uh, Michael David Smith writes for Pro Football Talk, although Jared Allen was limited in practice today with a foot injury, with a broken foot, he's doing <laughs> just fine and should be full speed for Super Bowl 50. Memphis Coach full Ross. speed. <laughs> Said designated Allen as limited in practice was just an opportunity to give him some time off, you know, a few minutes here and there to heal his broken foot. <laughs> and not an issue of a setback with his broken foot. Okay, so maybe that's why Vegas is because, so like, Thomas Davis is a broken wrist, Jared Allen is a broken foot. They're both starting. Maybe that might have something to do with it. Then again, Peyton Manning is playing without an arm, so. And, yeah, he can't feel his fingers, and he may only have, like, one good foot. <laughs> and can't, and can't. The injuries uh, balance out as well. Yeah, and can't take his. Yeah, the running back division is, you know, a by strategy, and how much of it is by injury. I mean, you don't get to this point with. You know, completely healthy teams. Chris Harris Jr., I, if he, it would be really nice to see him play the whole game. If he doesn't, then I definitely don't like Denver's chances. I'd be surprised if they just ran at Allen the entire game. <laughs> that, would be, that would be smart. You're like, let's, He's already a fine strategy, but with a broken foot? Oof. You're like, let's, let's see how you turn on this one. Let's, let's see if we can get you at an angle. Yeah, we need to get you to turn. Let's get Peyton Manning on the read option. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? And they never the see it coming. Manning's spin move is, do you think he can like defer his instinct to dive long enough to go around Jared Allen? <laughs> Actually, if he dives, he may be able to get back up and, th- and throw the ball. We discovered that a couple of weeks ago. They may have <laughs> been the Super Bowl. That might have been a mistake. Although Peyton Manning, apparently uh, that was like the plan and, or he had been planning for that in practice. Like, you know, I know these refs aren't going to be necessarily ready to call that. So uh, be ready. You're I'm like, going to try to pull some shit. I'm going to get all the calls Wait, tonight anyway. Yeah, he, he, there was, I think that was actually posted on Deadspin that, uh, that he had talked to, I believe it was Emmanuel Sanders and said, be ready for this and just keep going. I'm going to break it out this game. It's like, yeah, if, if I go down, don't stop running the route because I may get back up and throw the ball. <laughs> because I'm Peyton Manning and the call is going to go my way. Well, and not specifically for this game, but it was something that they had worked on in practice. Like, you know, if, if this ever happens in a game, I'm going to try to take advantage of it, so be ready. So speaking of Peyton Manning on the read option, uh, guess how many rushing touchdowns Peyton Manning has in his career. One. Two. <laughs> no, he has more than Brady. 
that's impressive because Brady's the uh, the king of the uh, the quarterback sneak. Um, boy, does he have ten? Four. Really? Yeah, this is great. I I, I looked this up right before the show. It's kind of stunning. All right. So so what's the number then? Uh, it is eighteen. That is not a stat I would have expected, although considering the number of years he's been in the league, it's not... He's averaging one per year. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's not terribly surprising. He's averaging he's, one per year. He has the same number as his jersey number. If you include the playoffs, he has... It, surprisingly, if you include the playoffs, he actually has 21. Hmm. 21. I'm looking at his pro football reference page to see if they're if they're clustered. Uh, it looks like uh, he had four, four in 2006? 2006, 2000, like 2006, he had four. 2007, he had three. And then <laughs> in 2008 and now, he has had two. <laughs> so I, if there is a prop bet for Peyton Manning will score a rushing touchdown, it is not the smart money. Was it in the postseason last year or the year before that he ended up breaking that out? Or was that a Sunday night football game that he just broke out a design I think it was run. a Sunday night football game against the Cowboys. That's where it was, what it was. Of course it was against the Yeah, it was the basically it was a play-action boot, and the cameraman got tricked. Because, I mean, why would he have the ball? Well, no one would have expected that, <laughs> which is why you take you, which is why you take Manning and run him directly at Jared Allen. <laughs> Allen will definitely be confused. Allen won't know what the hell is going on. He's used to chasing after midgets in the desert. He's not going to know what to do with, uh, with Peyton Manning. <laughs> So before, at, what, at what point would the like what what would your return have to be on the Peyton Manning rushing touchdown prop bet for you to take you know the over if the if the over under was at half it was one half yeah boy I would need at least fifteen to one so you would take plus ten thousand is that what it is no I don't know but I'm just saying I would take plus ten thousand. I heard on uh, on the office that you always got to take ten thousand to one odds every time. U.S. office or uh, or British office. U.S. Boy, I don't know. <laughs> because it's the American version of the office, it doesn't count. <laughs> I just just wanted to check. Just wanted to check. <laughs> okay. No, that's 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 interesting. Although there is a, uh, uh, and we could probably segue into uh, into the Super Bowl Fifty prop bets here, uh, yay soon. But there's there's a prop out there as to number of quarterbacks who will throw a or number of uh, people who will throw a pass in the Super Bowl, and uh, at two and a half. That makes sense because you could get Ted Ginn to throw. You could get Tolbert. Uh, I don't know Demarius Thomas to throw. Tolbert has thrown for them. Uh, has, has thrown for Carolina before too. Oh wow! That or Peyton Manning could get decked. Brock Osweiler could throw. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Is that is that what is the um, what's the prop on that? Do you know the odds? Uh, looking it up now. Can you mention it without giving us the odds? I'm. Sorry, Before we get I too deep into the props, uh, maybe we should make score predictions. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, so, so because for under is forty-five. Oh, no, you go first. And okay. Mine is five and a half. Although they initially set it at uh, three and a half, we'll say just for uh, for edification's sake. So that would be what uh, twenty-four, twenty-one, or twenty twenty-five, twenty-one. Carolina is what uh, what Vegas initially. Would have set the game at uh, something like that. Yeah, I'm going to say 34 to seven Carolina. Oh, Jesus! Yeah, it's not going to. Well, be. since we're, we're going to see a lot of uh, helmet den Manning face. Since uh, I um, have been betting with my heart, uh, and uh, and I've got got Denver to cover the spread, I might as well have Denver win. 18 to 16. At least one safety in there somewhere. Don't know where. uh, Okay, so how does Carolina get to 16? Two touchdowns and a safety? Yeah, two touchdowns and a safety. And then uh, Denver just knocks in like six field goals. 
considering the first play or the first scoring play of the Super Bowl over the last several years, a lot of the games has been a safety. It could just start out. Oh yeah, because Tom Brady threw intentional grounding against the. Uh, Which was such a crap call. Such what? A, that well, was, was such definitely a the right call. call. It was the right call, and you know why I know it's the right call? Because it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I feel badly for Tom Brady, who does that all season long, and then they call him for it in the Super Bowl. <laughs> like, rude. Poor guy. I know, it's just so hard being Tom Brady. <laughs> well, I'm going to piggyback on uh, on yours, Dusty, but it's going to be a little closer than that. I think the, uh, the Panthers do get to 34, and I think that uh, you're going to be looking at a 28 or a 30 from Denver. I'm going 28. 28, four touchdowns, just straight up? I think that much like every other uh, game where the 15-1 and one, uh, Carolina Panthers went up real big and then all of a sudden in the second half they forgot to play. And, uh, and that, allows the, uh, that allows Denver to come back. Or it could just mean that they get them into like field goal range and their kicker just nails it at one after another after another after another. That scenario's got to include some defensive touchdowns, right? There's got to be at least right. one to keep the lead pick six in there. Right. No, not all of this I mean, will be on Peyton to. Manning. Oh, and by the way, I think you mean the uh, the 15-2 and two Carolina Panthers. <laughs> right. De fact. I'm oh. pretty sure they have two losses. I read that on Facebook. That's right. Yeah, it's the I... one loss 15-2 and two Carolina Panthers. Exactly, it's the one loss 15. Okay, yep, my bad. There you go. Uh, now for the, uh, the the stranger section of uh, the, the betting action, the props. I'm, I'm my favorite is that uh, will there be an earthquake at the game is only or will there be an earthquake during the game is only ten to one. Now I'm curious how large of a radius around the game counts as there being an earthquake. Because like, what if there's an earthquake in the ocean, like two hundred miles away? Does that still count? It's got to be said on the broadcast, doesn't it? Oh, is that? Do you think that that's what the? Because uh, I don't know, like what what Boveda counts as an earthquake. Like maybe it has to register at the stadium above a particular Richter scale, right? Like what if it's only you know seven point earthquakes or above? Like that's it's got to do damage to fans, like that kind of earthquake. Well, if you're gonna do that, why the hell have it at ten to one? Like I feel like at this point, if you're gonna do that, you might as well just break out like which player is gonna get the concussion first. Oh, yeah, announcer must indicate there was an earthquake. Oh, it's right here. I probably should have just looked at it. Announcer must indicate there was during live broadcast from kickoff until final whistle. Yeah. Wow. 10 to 1. That's, that's crappy. I would, not, I would not take that. That's pretty low. I'm pretty sure there's, a, there's less than 10% chance that there's an earthquake. Is there anything on a biological like weapon attack from a homegrown terrorist outfit on Alcatraz? Is that on here anywhere? Can we hit control F to find <laughs> that? If Harris is the Marine in charge of the attack. Yes. <laughs> They're not terrorists. That, They're soldiers who need their due. I just want Phil Sims to be talking about Harris's uh, Marine record on uh, on the broadcast. <laughs> now he's got, he's got some great audibles. They should get Ed Harris to fly the F-15 over the stadium during the game, escort any, like, errant planes away. <laughs> I like that. The, the two planes that are that are guarding the airspace above the stadium are, are sent to go scramble after it. And, like, what do, what do they do if a plane doesn't comply with the no-fly zone? Like, if it just keeps flying right at the stadium, do they shoot it down over the stadium? I'm sure there's, like, a process. Like, I'm sure they, like... Is, is there a tractor beam? They detect them coming about? near the... Well, no, there's no... I'm sure they detect them coming near or have, like, a flight pattern that, that would have them cross over the stadium, and then they, like warn them and then they fly out and escort them while warning them and then obviously they shoot them down like what's the point if you're not going to shoot them down that's the thing is that how long do they escort them like this how large is this zone where an f-15 can intercept a slow flying aircraft and escort it and then shoot it down not over the stadium well it depends on i think if your flight path would take you into the no-fly zone like i'm sure i'm sure the radius for like warning people is pretty large but i'm sure they don't do anything for much of the radius if your flight path isn't going to go over the stadium. What if you were flying a blimp with a bunch of money that you got through a welfare scam and you're trying to give it back to the people <laughs> that you took it from to begin with? Can John? I'm Madden, sure if you explain that patiently to the to the pilots and the 
the F-14s that they'll... I'm, I'm asking for a friend. Play. This isn't This isn't for me. This is... <laughs> so is, this is no ordinary rain. <laughs> <laughs> that crazy money rain. I think you just have to hijack the good year, the Goodyear blimp in that case. You'd have to use the already existing because that's what Homer did, right? It wasn't just Homer. Used the blimp it was, that was already there. No, this, this was Peter Griffin. With money. This is Peter Griffin, the first uh, pilot episode of a uh, Family Guy. Oh, right, 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 right. That's what uh, Peter did. Yeah, Homer, Peter. What? They're the same trope. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> James is not impressed. <laughs> Uh, so did you know that The Rock is Michael Bay's favorite of his own movies? Didn't that have the least amount of explosions? It did uh, That's have true, but the average there. length of uh, an individual like shot is about two seconds. Wait, least amount of explosions? What about uh, Pain and Gain? Pain and Gain didn't have very many explosions. That's true, that was a Michael Bay flick? Like? Dangling off the side of a building. Well, that doesn't involve explosions. Oh, I, I, I suppose not. <laughs> yeah, Pain and Gain was a uh, or if Pain and Gain was a was a Michael Bay movie. It was surprisingly yeah, good, wow. and of all people to recommend that movie to me repeatedly, like was harassing me until I actually watched it, is our co-host Dusty O'Connell. That movie is so funny. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what I was in for when I watched that movie, and it blew me away. And then I found out that Michael Bay directed it, and it was even better. That movie is amazing. It is a must-watch. If you, okay, unless you, forty-nine percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Here is the critics' consensus on Rotten Tomatoes. It's kind of hilarious. It may be his most thought-provoking film to date, but Michael Bay's Pain and Gain ultimately loses its satirical edge in a stylized flurry of violent spectacle. I think that's accurate. Right around the time where the uh, where on the screen they actually had to because it's based on a true story. Right around the time on the screen they actually had to print out this actually happened. You you, <laughs> you, you have you, you kind of lose it because partway through you you forget this is a real story and then there's this one insane part where they actually have to put up this actually happened. Sort of like uh, the Scientology episode of South Park. Where like this is what Scientologists, what Scientologists actually, actually believe. believe. Yeah, yeah there's, oh, there's yeah. actually a subtitle because the the story is about these two uh, bodybuilders in Miami who like kidnap this rich dude because they're mad at rich people basically, and uh, try to like extort all of his money from him in a very convoluted and like uh, ill thought out plot, and the pratfalls that ensue are just like poor monk. It's it's um, <laughs> I know he gets beaten down so hard, but he's just so much smarter than the poor rock. He was just really, like really along for the ride. He's like the ultimate patsy in this movie. The Rock is is amazing in this movie. He turns in an Oscar worthy performance in this movie. <laughs> no, it, okay, it, I'm not joking. If uh, Robert Downey Jr. can be nominated for an Oscar for his performance in Tropic Thunder, then The Rock deserves an Oscar nomination for his performance in Pain and Gain. Uh, okay. That's that. That's that's that. Anyway, but uh, yeah, it, the the, the pratfalls are so ridiculous that you just like completely lose track of the idea that this like actually happened. And then the movie reminds you like the perfect moment when the most insane thing is happening. You're like, by the way, this is real. <laughs> People, <laughs> the Florida man is real. All right. Well, there's a couple more props. I want to get through some of them super quickly. Uh, Peyton Manning announcing his retirement in the post game interview. Yes is plus five hundred. No is minus a thousand. If I were able to move large amounts of money instead of small amounts of money, I would pound no. Uh, the, no. He's not going to do it in the post-game interview. All right, everybody, I'm done. This is my last game. No. <laughs> in any post-game interview will be like six words. Right? I'm just, uh, thanks, everybody. And then he leaves. This is... Uh, I thank this, my defense. This, Good this, this ties me with Eli, guys. Thanks. <laughs> just putting that out there. Uh, how many times will dab or dabbing be said by the announcers during the broadcast? The over-under is at two, and over is even. So definitely the over. That seems like pretty easy money. Yeah, that's that's. this is nearly Anthony Kita shirtless. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> License to print money, yeah. Uh, another good moving large amounts of money bet is uh, how many times will the Golden Gate Bridge be shown during the broadcast? The over-under is one half, and the over pays minus 300. 
Oh my God! Yes, it's, they're going to show the Golden Gate Bridge at least three times. At Even least. if halftime doesn't count, that's 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 the they, there it is. There's the Anthony Kiedis shirtless money right that's, there. That's your free money. Your your Norse Code free money Super Bowl bet is uh, over one half <laughs> on how many times <laughs> the Golden Gate Bridge will be shown. Let's see. Uh, do you many, do you identify any other ones? Uh, how many times will John Fox be said during the broadcast is a pretty good one. Uh, especially given that both head coaches have worked under John Fox in the past. The over oh, okay. one, uh, the over pays minus 140 and is maybe not as much of a lock as the Golden Gate Bridge, but uh, is still, uh, I, I feel like they at least say his name two times, once in reference to each coach. Or one, one announce, or each announcer says it once. There are so many permutations th- to them saying it twice. I think they will probably say it, but yeah, I think that that's definitely not anything near a lock. And I think that the over-under better reflects that, too, because the over is negative 140. Uh, what song will Coldplay play first during the halftime show? I would. It's 50 to 2 clocks, but I would bet that it's clocks. Really? But you don't think so? Well, they're... I mean, it's to promote their new album, right? So it's probably going to be Adventure of a Lifetime. And that's the... It's not to do anything. They just happen to have a new album. Set lists it's like that... halftime show. Yeah, set lists like that typically have... Either the first or the second song end up being uh, an old favorite that people actually know. And then they launch into, Hey, by the way, we got this new record. And here's two songs from it that are not that great. But you're going to like them anyway because we're playing with the Super Bowl. Oh, and you remember that other song? Here's Vita La Vida. And just like go into that. So you think yes. uh, Head Full of Dreams and Adventure of a Lifetime will be like songs number two and three? I, I, bet, they end, I bet they end on Fix You. It's uh, seven to two odds that they play it first, but I bet they end the show with Fix You. Yeah. yeah I would, uh, yeah, I would, I'm not going to guarantee, obviously, that it's, that it's clocks, but I would say that the odds are better than 15 to two. I think the odds are fantastic that I am going to be watching the Puppy Bowl during the, uh, during the halftime show. Yeah, I will have no idea whether or not I win any Dramagestes uh, yeah. on, on clocks. I got, a, uh, I got a good... Uh, I, I got a my Dramagestes on Viva La Vida. Yeah. I got a good, uh, got, got a good prop for you. Uh, MVP odds. These are good. Uh, the MVP for... Uh, I think... The, 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 here's the dark horse on it. Let's break out Brandon McManus. <laughs> 100 to 1. Hey, remember, I did pick uh, Denver eighteen to sixteen. If Denver wins with six field goals, then the odds are either it's Brandon McManus or a defensive player. And if it's eighteen points, that means there's probably no defensive touchdowns. And I think that defensive MVPs almost require a touchdown. Or uh, I guess you're Ray Lewis. I think those are the two options. <laughs> is there a scenario um, that Denver well, wins? You take uh, Derek Wolf in a parlay. Yeah. He's a hundred to one as well. You could probably get some pretty great odds on that parlay. Is there a situation yeah. where Denver wins and Manning doesn't get the uh, the MVP? I think it's very unlikely, but I mean, if if it's all just defensive scoring, I think if Keep Talib scores two touchdowns, then he gets it. Yeah. Otherwise, that's a hundred to one. Also, probably Peyton Manning. That's 100 to 1 also uh Ted Ginn Jr. 30 to 1. That's interesting. Demarius Thomas 25 to 1. Just, yeah, so, really? There's no way it's an offensive player on the Broncos other than Peyton Manning. It could be a defensive player, but there's no way it's it's someone It's that true. Can... If if an offensive player well, I mean it could be CJ Anderson 20 to 1, which don't those are actually still bad no. odds? Oh, um, I'm just saying it that. can be an offensive player that's not Peyton Manning. C.J. Anderson, you know, averages five yards a carry and gets three touchdowns, and Peyton Manning doesn't throw any. C.J. Anderson gets the MVP. Hey, that's not. I, mean, I agree that there's less than a five percent <laughs> chance of that happening. That is a scenario, but uh, here, okay, here's a better one. Uh, will Cam Newton break the Super Bowl record of most rushing yards by a quarterback? Uh, what, yes. what is the record? Uh, 64 yards by Steve McNair, Super Bowl 34. And so what's the what's the payout? Uh, yes is plus 275 or 11. Do it. Do that. Do everybody do that. 
<laughs> that, I'd like to remind you that this show does not have anything that can be construed as gambling advice. This is not gambling advice. advice. <laughs> this, if this you is have more dreams. cheer for it in your head. This is this is lifestyle management, not uh, not, not gambling just... advice. <laughs> lifestyle management. Dusty believes in fitness. Uh, that that's all this is. <laughs> you definitely run for sixty-four yards yourself. Is what we meant. <laughs> Be the Cam Newton, and then hand the ball off to a little girl, which is also a, po- a uh, um, which is also a prop as to if the ball is handed off to a boy or a girl, if uh, if he scores a touchdown. Not necessarily him. Any uh, Panthers player. Yeah. I don't. I don't think it has to specifically be Cam Newton. There's also a uh, a Steph Curry prop in here. Uh, if Steph Curry showed on TV during the broadcast, uh, what will he be wearing? Will he be wearing a personalized Carolina Steph Curry jersey? Will he not be wearing a jersey? Impossible. Do not bet that one. Uh, <laughs> not advice. Uh, a Cam Newton jersey or any other Carolina jersey? And I think the only two options are Newton or personalized. I love that personalized is the favorite. Like, is, I, is the- I would have to look through the other Steph Curry, because he's won them a lot. I'd have to look through the other Steph Curry Carolina jersey Let's let's see what uh let's see what a quick Google search does. Carolina Jersey Steph Curry. And see, you know, what he's worn in the past. Oh, he has multiple personalized Steph Curry Carolina jerseys with his number 30 on them. So, yeah, I can see why that's the favorite. I feel like okay. that's taking it one step too far if you're a professional athlete for a team and you you go out and get a jersey for a different professional sport and even put your own number on it. Like that takes it a step too far, right? Well, even I think if- it depends if you ever got a personalized Jersey before you were a professional athlete of that team, then I think, I think it's okay. Mm. He also has Cam Newton jerseys in the, in the, but they appear far less often. Here's a prop. Will the team that chooses heads or tails in the coin toss be correct? I want to, I want to ask uh, here if there's a prop for, if the uh, if the coin actually flips or if it does not flip in the air <laughs> because there is one that says will the referee redo the coin toss which is a uh, 20 to 1 for uh, for yes there's a less than 5% chance that he redoes the coin toss <laughs> that's silly i know after all the coin toss drama over the last couple of weeks you know they're like he's like practicing right now in the hotel <laughs> right it was it was it was the same referee right the Cleet Blakeman, right? He was he the one that I'm gonna search Cleet Blakeman coin to us. Was it him? It was Cleet Blakeman. So it is that guy, which means it's guaranteed not to happen. <laughs> not this time. <laughs> fool uh, me twice, you shame that? on you. Can't fool me twice. Uh, <laughs> Will is- Mike Carey be wrong about a challenge? Was that like a plus 110 on no? That is your guaranteed money right plus there. Plus 110 on yes. What? That is your guaranteed money yeah, maker. So when, money I, maker. when I saw this, I, I immediately thought, now I have to go, because like that, it is so wrong that yes has, has favorable odds. Now I have to go through like a bunch of CBS broadcasts and see if he's actually right and we just point out when he's wrong. But there's, there's no way. He, he has to be wrong way more often than he's – like that's – he must be consulted on live broadcast and must clearly take a stance on his position. So he can't just be like, well, it's it's tough, Phil. I want him to do that <laughs> if, all If he's game. not consulted, you get you get your money back. Yeah. So I want, I I want him totally, to do that. I want him to do that a decent hedge. all game. That would be amazing if he just goes, I don't know, guys. Uh, Jim, what do you think? I'm not, I don't think I should make a stand <laughs> on this one. What What is your educated guess? Well, I've been terrible all year. The rule book is at least five pages, so I guess I couldn't tell you. Back to you, Phil. I'm just glad I'm not the one on the field right now making a decision. If you might say that. Let's see, how many wings will Buffalo Wild Wings sell? Boring. Which region will have a higher Nielsen rating? Boring. Nielsen rating ones are boring. Will Left Shark make an appearance? No. Left Shark is so last year. Left Shark's not going to make it. Well, that might actually be a reason it makes an appearance. I wouldn't be surprised if the organizers were behind the times. Will the announcers mention that Kubiak was Elway's backup during the broadcast? 
Ooh, what's the what's the yes? Yes, plus one twenty. That is um, potentially some some value there. Yeah, that's that's an interesting set of odds. I would say that that is a valuable set of odds, not to Vegas. I wasn't able to find one, although I did see how many times will Archie Manning be shown on TV during the broadcast. Uh, Over under appears to be at uh, one and a half. The he, I mean, he likes to hide. That's the problem. Yeah. Um, but man, if 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 Peyton wins, you have to imagine there's some like shot of the whole Manning clan, Eli, and everything too. So see, that won't count. That that'll be after the final whistle. That'll be yeah. Uh, it's it's only like it, half time is excluded and after is excluded. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so here's a great prop. But Denver wins the Super Bowl. Peyton Manning retires. San Antonio Spurs win an NBA championship, and Tim Duncan retires. Twenty to one. That's it. I would. Yeah, I mean, that's. Yeah, I take it. Twenty to one, hypothetically. What will be higher? Trump percentage points in the New Hampshire primary. Total points scored by the winning Super Bowl team. That is great. That's really good. Take the points. It's plus one fifty. <laughs> this stock is selling. Sell, sell. Go the points. <laughs> I actually I have no idea uh how he's pulling in New Hampshire. I bet five thirty eight has a pretty good idea. Um yeah, probably take Trump. Pierce Boveda the projected likes. results are no. I was wrong. Sorry, I was looking at the chances again. The projected results from five thirty eight are twenty seven point six. Uh, so, and the bell curve is is pretty wide. So, you know, I think actually, nah, I still take Trump. Wow. Yeah, I didn't expect that's, that. This self finance campaign that hasn't heard of ground game. I just want Still to. Hasn't. I just want to like use this portion of the show to derail any sort of political campaign a reef may end up getting like involved in later in life, and just like over and over repeat the line: "Take Trump, take Trump." <laughs> Not often. In fact, this will probably be the only situation you will ever hear a reef go, "Take Trump." But if it's if it's out of context, I could just be like, "Take the Trump cards." Exactly. Maybe he's playing spades. Mm-hmm. Maybe you just explain it away. No, no, I wasn't I wasn't advocating <laughs> voting for Trump. I was advocating card games. I'm a big fan of card games. Pro card games. How's that, how's the over-under on total sacks for Von Miller is one half. And the overpay really? is minus 225. I mean, that, that oh. might be... That's not that great of money, but if you've got a lot to spend, then if you've got a... If you are flush with Jim Majesties, it's probably going to get a sack, so... I wouldn't. I wouldn't do for negative two twenty five. Nah, I wouldn't do it for that. Okay. What? What? Uh, at what price would you start to consider that? Um. Actually, it would. It would have to be pretty close to even for me. So it'd have to be like negative one fifteen or something. Oh wow. So okay. All right. Sacks are kind of rare, man. We do I'm just putting abbing. Is there, a, is there like a Von Miller uh, like combined prop for sacks? Does not look like Boveda has one, according to our promotional materials. Oh, I think I see why uh, a lot of so Von Miller had has had three and a half sacks over the last three games. I think that's blinding people. He had eleven sacks this season. Recency bias. Yeah. What color will the liquid be that is poured on the coach? Looks like orange is the favorite at five to four. If I could take not orange, I would take that. But if you could take the field versus orange, yeah. But no, it's blue, clear, yellow, red, green, or purple, and that will end up at anything on any of those specific colors. Should we uh, should we wrap up the prop bets? Yeah, sure. Well, actually, let's finish with this one. Who will the Super Bowl MVP mention first? God, two to one. Team, two to one. City slash fan, six to ones. Coach, fifteen to two. Family, fifteen to one. Does not mention anyone above nine to four. 
So Satan I think is so Satan's is right out of there, right? I see. I I like team. Team at two to one. You got to go with you got. Well, I mean, I don't know about the price. I would like it better at three to one or four, but uh, but I, I yeah, I would, and I would love it at a hundred to one, Dusty. Yeah, you're right. Okay, but I'm just saying that <laughs> you know, if team was even slightly less of a prohibitive favorite or tied for favorite, then I would still feel good about it. I'm. I feel like of these choices, it is most likely to be team. I don't know. Really, that- I think it's most likely to be God. I think. Really. Not we every- always talk about God. Yeah, but it's not like Benson Henderson is out there winning the Super Bowl or something. <laughs> like, and it's literally <laughs> going to be the first thing he ends up saying when he ends up winning. <laughs> well, okay, so so the two most likely Super Bowl MVPs are Cam and Peyton. Cam and Peyton, right? Yeah. Cam almost assuredly will thank God first. Peyton would assuredly thank his team first. Oh, are you kidding? Yeah, I mean, you're right. First thing, but Cam, Cam is more likely to be the Super Bowl MVP. No, no, no. Cam is going to play up the role of the villain here, and the first thing he's going to say is, "This is dedicated to my to my new bastard son." And then, like, oh, like that that that's family oh, like right that. there. Yeah, it's like, oh, by the way, that thing that people were criticizing me for. Yeah, so my bastard son and I, and <laughs> I like that a lot. I already kind of liked family at 15 to one. So yeah, yeah I, I think these long shots are just like so long. They're just free money for, you, 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 you think, know. Oh no. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying, I think, you know, I think I'll, coach is super long. I'll put that out there. I will say that even at 15 to two coaches, no, coach is a massive long shot on the Denver side. John Elway is uh, is more likely than Gary Kubiak. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Peyton sure. Manning has been working at cross purposes to Gary Kubiak most of the season. <laughs> Uh, the like city slash yeah, for you know, I, don't, I don't know about that. Uh, I, I think all these things have a chance to be like mentioned in the post game press conference or whatever. But as far as first, it's it's probably team, and maybe God if you're Cam Newton. All right. So, is there anything else we want to talk about? Beyonce's footwear, amount of times Coop X mentioned. Ugh. Yeah. Beyonce's all right. Footwear. I think we're done with the uh, with the prop bets. All right. Who is super concerned did, about Beyonce's Did we at least did we at least record what our prop bets, which ones we said we'd take, so we can see if we came out ahead in Dermot Justice in the next show? Sure did. Uh, I, I don't think we put a number of units on any of the bets. We'll do that after the show and, and pretend that it was all above board. Perfect. That sounds about right. I'm not editing that out. That'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't intending you to. Pulling back the curtain on... Uh, code. So we do have a handful of mailbag questions, nearly all about the Vikings. All right. That, uh, that's like basically Vikings news. Hooray. Uh, I feel like I, I butchered uh, Joachim, Joachim Ortman's name last time I tried to pronounce it. So he writes this again. Uh, <laughs> the or, bastard. At J underscore Ortman on Twitter. I, I apologize. I, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, I was running. I was running pretty hot there for a while. Like I went like a year and a half before I mispronounced anybody's name, and I had some pretty heroic names. At any rate, uh, what are your thoughts on Taylor Heineke replacing Sean Hill as the backup? Could potentially save some money. Yeah, I, I don't know how significant the money saving aspect of that is because w- with Sean Hill's contract, like three million dollars, probably less. Um, Heineke replacing Hill? Uh, maybe I would rather ha- uh, have Hill play out his contract with Heineke as the third backup. Um, just so Heineke has more time because the, those third quarterbacks just get zero reps. And so the amount of time that he's had to learn, and he's had a lot to learn, isn't very much. So I'd like to give him twice the amount of time he's had so far. So in the long run, maybe, and maybe we'll get to see how he performs in camp. But for now, I would say I'd rather have Hill, even though he looked pretty bad in his limited showing. Ben Alpha B writes us, how much more talented are these offensive lines, I assume he means Carolina and Denver, than the Vikings? Everyone decries the Vikings' talent, but I don't see a huge disparity. Peyton got sacked 4.6% of the time, the second highest in his career, and he's notoriously good at avoiding sacks. Brock was 7.7%. It seemed like Carolina kept six or seven in protection often to me, and they were ahead a bunch and ran 50% more of the time. And Football Outsiders' offensive line numbers show them pretty evenly. Yeah, I mentioned earlier in the show, I think Carolina's offensive line is is quite good. Obviously, like you mentioned, Ben, it's uh, it's better against 
uh, the run than it is uh, protecting in the pass. But I still think it's actually a pretty good offensive line, even in pass protection. I haven't taken a look at Football Outsiders' is offensive line numbers, and the nice thing about them is that they adjust offensive line performance to their opponent. But then, but the poor thing is that it only takes into account sack numbers. Uh, given how much hurry data has proliferated, uh, it may be possible in the future for them to adjust for that, but they've not done that. So uh, it is difficult to say uh, given those kinds of numbers, but I think that uh, they tend to they tend to actually be pretty good. And keeping six in protection isn't an indictment of an offensive line. Most offensive lines on pass plays will most often keep six in protection because you don't tend to have five players out running patterns uh, for a lot of teams uh, on most plays. So that's not a huge indictment. Um, I think it's I think it's significantly above average in pass protection too. So I would say yeah, it is much better. Um, I did talk about this a little bit on the last show. I think it was Bill Anderson, um, or actually, I'm pretty sure it was Bill. I don't know if it was Anderson. Asked, you know, hey, uh, all of these teams, and at the time it was uh, the uh, conference round, uh, the conference championship round, all these teams have poor offensive lines, plus also Seattle. Uh, how important are offensive lines? And I think that it is uh, relative to the quarterback. You mentioned, Ben, that Peyton ha- is notoriously good at avoiding sacks. Uh, and this year uh, he got sacked. Second highest in his career. Denver definitely has a bad offensive line, especially in terms of pass protection. Um, And I think that this is just kind of an outlier year. Obviously, Seattle's been doing pretty well uh, year to year to year with a bad offensive line. But I think for the most part, uh, in most years, uh, teams with a good offensive line do better. Even like the Patriots who had a bad offensive line this year, they generally have a a much better offensive line. Uh, Alex Jury writes (laughs) in with a question submitted by email. Short version, Cordero Patterson. Does he have any potential left in anything football related and can he reach it and can he be useful and to whom and for what price? Uh, if you're talking about like trading Patterson, I think, yeah, I mean, there's probably a team that might be willing to, but not for very much. I think the, the ceiling for his trade value would be fourth rounder. And I was going to say fifth, but I mean, he is a very good returner. Um, but yeah, I think that that might be the ceiling on a straight. I mean, because you know, you don't have that many kick returns anymore. And he's not a punt returner, uh, so you just you don't have that many kicks. Um, especially like if you're an AFC West team, you'll never uh, return the ball against the Broncos because they, you know, not only have a good kicker, but I mean, they're a mile high. Uh, so yeah, it'll it'll be difficult to to trade him in terms of what potentially is left. I think that uh, whatever potential he had. Um, you know, we're not going to end up seeing it. So functionally, he's not going to have a ton of potential. Um, so I, I guess I just don't see him turning into the kind of receiver that'll get, you know, 400 to 800 yards in a season. Polo Town writes in the email question as well. As all Vikings fans, I've been ruminating about the offensive line. Since Pro Football Focus has Berger rated as the top center, most people accept that he should remain the starting center. Two questions. One, does the PFF rating take into account the center's responsibility recognizing sets and calling protection? Is Berger or Sully better at it, and how could you quantify that? Uh, two, if the rating is based on blocking, could the result be affected by the defense targeting the left guard or right tackle? Uh, so I'll answer two first. Uh, not quite, sort of. Uh, if, they, if the defense tends to target a guard more often, Uh, then the center will be on double teams more often, which means that they're less likely to be liable on stuff. Um, So it can be affected. Um, The right tackle, no, not as much. Uh, Defenses tend to attack the edge with edge players and the interior with interior players. Obviously, you know, blitzing up the middle versus blitzing on the edge is a decision you can make, but I think that uh, the number of times you make that decision based on the play of the right tackle versus the play of the center uh, is not very often, so... Um, it can, but probably not as much. I think that the guard matters more. Uh, the first question, uh, they only grade blocking. They do not grade, you know, a center's responsibility for recognizing defensive sets. If there's an unblocked blitzer uh, or something like that, they don't um, they they don't penalize anyone unless it's clear that one of the offensive linemen had the responsibility of that person and then they didn't pick that person up. Uh, it is very, very difficult to quantify. Um, I think that, if you uh, have like a season, right, where you, you have your season split in two with, with uh, you know, Berger taking half of the, the center snaps and Sully taking half of them, not even in the same games, 
you could do a decent job um, by just finding the number, uh, just finding, you know, if the rest of the offensive line stayed the same, finding, you know, the pass blocking efficiency with or without that player. But it, it's it's subject to so many problems, and you don't get that clean of a situation except, like, close to it in, like, 2010 or 2011 uh, when Berger had a couple of games uh, that you really would not be able to quantify it. But based on what I've seen, and based on talking to the players, you know, Sully is significantly better at it, miles better at it. Uh, and we did see a number of protection mistakes throughout the season this year, and I think that not having Sully at center, and actually it's even bigger for uh, for run blocking uh, and, and doing those assignments there, uh, and, uh, and not having Sully at center, I think, impacted both pretty significantly. Racer K at RacerCraft writes us, for those wanting to get more knowledgeable about the game, for example, the difference between a West Coast or an Earhart Perkins or an Air Coriel offense, do you have any book recommendations? I would recommend both of the Smart Football books written by Chris Brown. He runs an excellent blog called Smart Football. Um, and uh, and they're, they're, they're fantastic. I would also recommend a book, uh, Blood, Sweat, and Shock by Tim Layden. Other people really like, um, you know, Take Your Eye Off the Ball by Pat Kirwan. I think that's less related to, like, the schematic stuff that you're looking for um, and more related to, like, how people, like, evaluate football and stuff like that. Um, I do like – two other books that I really liked um, were uh, were Tom Halberstam's, like, The Education of a Coach, which talks about Bill Belichick a lot. And um, what I like even more than that, uh, Games That Change the Game, which is written by Ron Jaworski, uh, which despite that fact is actually very good. Uh, and it talks about, I think it was 13 games that uh, changed the nature of football forever. And it even includes uh, Bill Belichick's game plan against, uh, against the Rams. And it may have included Belichick's game plan against, uh, against the Bills, uh, both in the Super Bowl um, so go bill. Um, uh, but those are, those are all great. And then there's, you know, other books beyond that, that I would recommend. I could even come up with a book list at some point in the off season. There's also a great, uh, Twitter follow uh, slash website you could go to as well. If you were interested, uh, inside the pylon, I believe is it. Believe Fantastic. Name of it. Love it. Just an absolutely great follow. Some just, oh, yeah, just most of, most really of the articles written stuff. there are by former players or former scouts or former coaches. So it's like, if if the authority of that is really important to you, uh, yeah. they have that. Yeah, if you're if you're not following them, you should be because the stuff coming out of there is brilliant. Andrew Burns at underscore a Burns writes us: What is your favorite Coldplay album, and why is it Rush of Blood to the Head? <laughs> um, oh, I haven't listened to all the Coldplay albums. Uh, the uh, I, I was really obsessed with uh, Viva La Vida, despite it being a very clear ripoff of Joe Satriani. Uh, and so I'm going to have to go with that, which I think the name of the album is like Viva La Vida plus like two other words. So, Sorry. Uh, not some, a huge Coldplay fan, somehow, so I'm not going to like cape for any of them. Somehow the whole Coldplay thing passed me by. I'm not entirely sure exactly how that happened, but like all of a sudden I, I was in college and people were listening to Coldplay and I just didn't get it. So I don't think I've actually <laughs> listened to an entire Coldplay album, which says something because I went into music and like was just eating up everything I could, but just never really cared about. Like I heard the singles, obviously. I heard Yellow. I heard uh, Clocks and everything. Just never, uh, never cared. Yeah, I don't dislike Coldplay, but like, yeah, it's just it's never been never been my jam. I know that he named his kids something awful. But that's, you know, that's neither here nor there. Who hasn't done that, Dusty? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I guess you. Um, my favorite Coldplay album is also not A Rush of Blood to the Head. And I think, so uh, one of my friends described it to me when it first came out way back in like 2001 as uh, like, like halfway, like, like a cross between Dave Matthews Band and Radiohead, which sounded awful. <laughs> that sounds terrible. Also, I don't, I don't know if that's a really accurate way to describe Coldplay. Cross of something a Radiohead, maybe, but I wouldn't pick Dave Matthews. Yeah, it's not very, but it's so just like kind of standardly poppy. And this was like long after OK Computer came out. This was after Kid A came out. This is when like after Radiohead kind of started getting like weird. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah, after they got weirder. I mean, well, yeah. not that, that was bad, but I mean, like, the Benz and Pablo Honey, like, those are at least recognizable as, like, rock albums. Right. Uh, my favorite Coldplay album, though, is X and Y. I was going to ask why why uh, there wasn't any love for X and Y in the question, but, you know. It's an album. Yeah, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's pretty good. Also, I just found, uh, speaking of Coldplay, I just found someone who was giving advice on, uh, on, on the Coldplay prop bet. They also went with clocks. They went over a bunch of Coldplay set lists. So between, if you believe that the new album is going to feature, then yes, Adventure of a Lifetime is the correct favorite. But they're underrating a head full of dreams at 10 to 1 because it has been the opening song for recent shows when Adventure of a Lifetime does not lead. Oh, wow. So there might be some, some hidden value there if you yes. still have money to burn. If you still have German Jesse's to burn after all of our Stone Cold Locks of the Century of the Week. Yeah, so, but it's still likely to be clocks according to Fantasy Douche. Thanks, I Fantasy Douche. Twitter handle and not just a pejorative that you came up with in the heat of the moment. Yeah, it's, it's at Fantasy Douche and he signed his prediction Fantasy Douche. It's at Rotoviz. I was going to say, why can't it be both? Yay! <laughs> uh, Judd Zolgaz Hoodie at Jay-Z Hoodie writes in, if you have to make one can't-miss meal or snack for the Super Bowl, what would it be? Oh, that's tough, because normally I make uh, jalapeno poppers, but I wouldn't make them my go-to. That's just what I usually make for football games. Um, I should have a go-to, but I just... every The stuff that I make is just not great Super Bowl fare, so I don't tend to make a lot of... That just, that just shows that you're a failure in life and in No, that's true. Food. I am. I'm definitely a failure in life. Bringing and food to Super Bowl parties. I, however, um, I make a queso that is fantastic. That Oh, uh, what? I mean, I make a pretty good queso, man. I'm, like is it better than Alden Brown's short rib queso? Probably. That is delicious. I've made that. Whew. I uh, I actually have the, uh, of all things, I actually have the, the recipe on my phone uh, at the moment. It's that good. It I, I keep, bust it out. I bust it out every once in a while. I'm like walking through the uh, I'm walking through the grocery store. So it's like, more than just Velveeta and Rotel. Oh God, yeah. People who just do that, <laughs> why? Like what? What is what is wrong with you? Because <laughs> um, I'll end up getting uh, I'll end up putting two pounds of uh, or yeah, ends up putting uh, two pounds of meat in. Usually eighty twenty. Um, Two packets of tacos, Sounds. tacos uh, seasoning. One low sodium because this is going to be salty enough. Uh, one hot and spicy. Okay. Uh, eight ounce uh, brick of pepper jack, cube it. Eight ounce uh, thing of a uh, sharp cheddar, cube it. He, and there is sixteen ounces of Velveeta, Velveeta because sure it melts really well. I it, don't have like an issue does. with it in queso, but yeah. like the reason I brought it up is because. Someone asked me if I had had, uh, you know, Rotel whatever before, and I was like, no. And he's like, well, I'm going to change your life and just microwave some Rotel <laughs> with Velveeta. <laughs> I, uh, and I actually changed. Not, yeah. I, like, in theory, but not for the better. Yeah. For the better. Yeah. <laughs> his, his life got a little more sad that day. Uh, I uh, actually do two cans of the of the Rotel with the lime in it for just a, oh, little, yeah. just a little additional flavor, draining most of the uh, most of the liquid. And then three yeah, jalapenos yeah. and uh, two serranos. Uh, take the seeds out and put that in a uh, put that in a crock pot for a little bit with a, just a little bit of milk. And uh, and uh, oh, uh, Delta BC Dad, since we're on the topic, if you're dealing with serranos, you should probably wear gloves. Oh yeah, by the way, definitely hot <laughs> enough. <that>. Losers, <laughs> if you touch your eye, you will really wish you hadn't, and probably. Not enjoy the game very much. If you're going to be um, dealing with... I make a really good... So to answer this question, actually, uh, I'll make this the answer because every time I've made it, it's been a huge success, a shrimp ceviche, um, which is... It's a fantastic Super Bowl uh, uh, snack. I mean, because, you know, you could you could have chips or pita or whatever and treat it like a salsa because that's what a ceviche is, basically. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's, it's just delicious. A little bit of fresh avocado. You're bringing something that isn't guacamole, and avocados are like cheap everywhere right now for some reason. Uh, a little mm -hmm. bit of like snapper or flounder, you know, some kind of fish to break up all that shrimp. You know, it's it's not super expensive. It's like light, delicious. I like, I like where your head's at. If I if I was not going to like if if I was not a restaurant person and was not going to a party like at a closed restaurant, I would definitely uh, bring ceviche. That sounds really great. 
uh, my contribute. Well, uh, I wanted to tip my hat to James for not using shredded cheese in your queso. I would rather see Velveeta in a queso than shredded cheese because Velveeta gives a good texture. Shredded cheese right. gives a bad texture. Uh, my contribution to the uh, to the pool is uh, Settlers of Catan nachos. Oh, I saw that picture. Uh, that was great. That the looked awesome. Picture is all over the internet, but did you know there is an entire Settlers of Catan cookbook? Oh no, I did not know that. Uh, it it's not much of a cookbook, really. It's mostly a a photo spread of different things put into uh it, you know little. Hexagon. Put into the map. That's, yeah, that form a map. But you know, you can arrange it artfully, and you know, have the you know, ingredients that resemble, uh, you know, cards in settlers. Uh, the key, though, is the hexagonal blue corn chips. And yes. in sync to the show notes, uh, settlers of the Noms personalized nacho board. Uh, there's a link to where you can buy the uh, chips online. That uh, will let you get the full Settlers of Catan effect. So nothing, nothing less nerdy will do than uh, Settlers of Catan nachos. But I will also include a link to uh, Alton Brown's short rib queso, because uh, queso is just one of those things that you know it, it's it's perfect for every party, and the slow cooker short rib queso is phenomenal. I've actually had uh, I used to bring the queso out to like work functions and uh, places I've long since uh, gone away from. And I've been asked repeatedly for my queso recipe or like, so next time you make that, you should just bring over a small container of it over here. Just just for, f- I won't tell anybody, you, you can do it. Um, <laughs> not, not we wow. wish you'd come back, but would you please give us your queso yeah, recipe? We, you know, we, could, uh, we, you know, we could take or leave you as an employee, but if you could just bring that to the potluck, <laughs> that, would, uh, that would be fantastic. And it, I, they're... We're not uh, we're not friendly enough at our current uh, at our at my current position to actually have a potluck or haven't in the last year as opposed to the last place where it was like every like month or two, so I uh, I I've, I've been making it more often I've been I've been needing the uh, needing the queso needing the cheese so it's a really good uh, it's a really good thing and I I think when when Dusty when you come through here next I'll I'll see if I can whip that up or use something out of the uh, the cooking comically uh, cookbook. Have you ever oh have you have you uh, have you seen that one or like the guy who like makes it like in a in like meme fashion uh, ended up putting a bunch of on a bunch of them on Reddit. He made it like the famous one was the big chili one that he put together, but uh, it's a really really great uh, really great cookbook. Uh, this isn't the guy that just like has a mental breakdown and starts smashing everything in the kitchen. No 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 uh, no no. He might, but he might be drunk during it. But it's. it's oh no! I'm, I'm looking at this website. This is actually uh, this is pretty good. If I if I did cooking stuff on the internet, this is probably how I would do it. Yeah. Uh, but now I don't have to because this guy has already done it, and uh, <laughs> it looks like he uses pretty legit ingredients and uh, I don't a good, honest process. I've read That's through it. There's not a lot of smoked paprika, but there's but but there well, is <laughs> well, nothing. Well, that's one way to upgrade smoked. the recipe. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You can just <laughs> add that and immediately seem like a gourmand. Oh, I like how also, the, uh, I just I just looked at that Alton Brown uh, queso recipe again. Whew. That looks really good. I know it's making me hungry. I want I want, I want queso. I like how the uh, the Super Bowl prop bet uh, episode ends with a bunch of uh, guys looking at food, going, "Man, that that would be really good right now." If we could <laughs> I need to get me some of those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nothing about Cam Newton's intangibles. We're sitting here talking about cheese. <laughs> Norse Code, the number one podcast for guys who eventually just get hungry while making podcasts. For your <laughs> of Peter Roach, queso? Yeah. With lime. Go lime or go home. I like lime. And we've got we've got some other questions, don't we? Or is that it? Uh there's Oh, uh which wins out? A reef's love of Peyton Manning or a reef's love of trolling people who hate Cam Newton? Well, so it's a win-win, obviously, but uh, it's definitely my love of Peyton Manning. So this is the first Super Bowl where two first round or uh, two number one draft picks play against each other at uh, at the quarterback position. The the first ever. Yes. Oh, maybe that's because Johnny Unitas didn't play against Joe Namath. It was like Earl Morrill that played against him, right? Or no. 
Wait, no, Johnny Unitas wasn't a number one pick. He might have been undrafted. No, he's he's our ninth round pick. That's why. Oh yeah, because he went to the Pittsburgh Steelers, showed up at camp, and they kicked him out, even though they drafted him. <laughs> Change their mind. We don't want you anymore. You bum. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Cam, well, these would actually be Cam Newton's uh, physical tangibles. Uh, he could become the first quarterback ever to have won a national championship, the Heisman Trophy, and a Super Bowl, and a junior college national title. The best money Auburn wow. ever spent. <laughs> <laughs> most decorated football player at any level. I bet he won uh, his high school and peewee leagues, too. All right. Well, uh, that's going to do it for your Super Bowl preview from Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. You can find us on the internet at norsecodepodcast.com, on Facebook at facebook.com slash Daily Norseman. Uh, the Daily Norseman.com is, or I guess just Daily Norseman.com. Is where you can find all of our <laughs> episodes posted. Well, no, because it's thevikingage.com, and that screws me up every time I try to type it in. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Fair enough. So, yeah, Daily Norseman. Uh, all the new episodes there, plus uh, a lot of great writing from uh, blogger extraordinaire Arif Hassan and others. Um, you can follow... Well, actually, you can get the new episodes there, but we would prefer you signed up to, like, iTunes or to a lesser extent Stitcher or some other podcast aggregator, because then you can get new episodes the minute... They are released for public consumption, and you don't have to worry about uh, waking up early in the morning to make that first crucial click on your commute. Up to the minute podcast updates. <laughs> up to the minute, because once you've waited an entire week, those those minutes are precious. Exactly. Uh, you can find the show on Twitter at NorseCodeDN. Producer James is the guy behind that feed. His personal feed is at Big Mono. I'm at Dusty O'Connell. Useful human Arif Hassan is at Arif Hassan NFL. And uh, before we yeah, go, yes, we should uh, uh, we should thank Arif for uh, for hosting last week and uh, and boldly going where he's never really gone bef- uh, before. Oh yeah, that uh, I thought that was going to turn into an unmitigated disaster. It seemed to have not. Uh, so. You all are lucky that I didn't just start doing this on my own. Slash, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay with me because I, I was actually like bracing. I was girding my loins for a bunch of why do you even need other hosts comments, but it seems like there were not that terribly many of them. Although I think there that were may be comments to uh, <laughs> why don't you get other guests? Which, uh, <laughs> that was one of the best comments I've read on any of our posts. That was a, that was amazing. And that's another just to take bong grips. Poor Justice gets no respect. Although, no, and hold on, he was taking bong grips in Oregon, not uh, in Mobile. He was he was already he had already left Mobile. It was totally legal, probably, for him to be doing what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, uh, I'm glad that. Our listeners, or some of our listeners at least, are on the same page as we are, confirming that Justice truly is the worst guest. The worst guest. Exactly. Also, I believe he's been on the most shows. I know, but we, for some reason, we still love him. Yeah, he's been on the most shows and the most, uh, and the most lost shows somehow. That's true. He, he's, he's the only person that. to to have been on multiple lost shows. Mm-hmm. I meant it when I, uh, uh, I meant it on the in the opening of uh, of, of last week's sh- of of this Monday's show. Yeah, this Monday's show. When uh, I said in a rare sign of solidarity, Dusty and I both looked at each other. And went, nope. This is your this is your job, Arif. You. <laughs> this is this is all uh, this is all on you. When I offered to record whatever whatever happened that day, but uh, after actually it was funny because we we attempted to record. <laughs> A show with Justice, but uh, due to technical problems on his end, we were unable to complete our task. So go figure. At any rate, the uh, the show turned out great. Thanks a lot, Arif, for stepping in to uh, to host your own show, and uh, thank you for not immediately being better at it than we are. <laughs> it's, uh, it's <laughs> no nice problem. Not, still needed. And uh, that's going to do it. Unless you gentlemen have any any parting shots, anything that you feel like we did not adequately beat to death in this uh, arduous death march to the end of the football season. I, I think we're good. I think I've added enough references to the movie The Rock. I feel like I, I hit the number that I w- told you I was trying to hit. Uh, so I think we're good. 
You hit your own over under, so we're good. Yeah, I, I, I think I did. Well, all right. Enjoy the big game, everyone. We will join you again this postseason with the beginning of the draft of Palooza. Uh, perhaps with a guest, perhaps not. But one way or another, we can promise you optimal digital multimedia content from the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings, Norse Code. So until then, our formula is this. Losers whine about their best. Winners go home and bone the prom queen. See you next week. Norse Code is the official podcast of the Daily Norseman SB Nation blog and is produced with cooperation from Pompous Jerk Productions. Pompous Jerk Productions. Attitude with attitude. The opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of their contributors and do not reflect official positions of the Minnesota Vikings, SB Nation, the Daily Norseman staff, or PJP. No information in this podcast should be construed as gambling advice. Please obey all local gaming laws. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth.